Hello, welcome back to The Charge Cycle. My name is Todd Trum, and I'm the CEO of Emission Control and your host here. And today we are covering the topic of charging system ownership and maintenance. Uh, there are a lot of unknown issues out there as it relates to downtime. You may have experienced it yourself. There's a lot of unreliable network notifications out there and a host of other issues related to EVSE level two and DC fast charging maintenance problems. So how are we addressing that? Um, today, I'm extremely happy to have on Dave and Alex Vikertovsky, owners and operators of Advanced Technical Services, also known as ATS. Um, as I understand it, ATS for years served as a technically focused support mechanism for a lot of the big OEMs over the years, but recently have expanded their services into the fast moving, fast deploying world of EVSE maintenance and remanufacturing. So happy to dive into this. Alex and Dave, welcome to the Charge Cycle. Thank you, Todd. Great to be here. Thanks, Todd. So uh, again, you guys have a long history in the automotive world. I would love to hear a little bit more of the background on the company and, and on yourselves, um, and then really kind of take some take some time to expand on really how you ended up in this EVSE space. I mean, it's a little bit different than working with the big three uh, over the years. And so uh, take some time to kind of tell us what ATS is, where you guys are at, give us some history on the company and, uh, and some uh, details there. So uh, we, we went in business in 1981. One of our major goals, Todd, was to support, better support, the repair of electronic products for automotive customers in the Midwest. Uh, we left a company that really wasn't supporting the dealers uh, as we thought they should, so that was really our driving force to improve the type of repair, uh, turnaround time, and quality that dealers needed, right? And so that was our focus. Uh, you know, 40 years ago, uh, there was very little electronics in the car. It was a radio and a cluster was probably the two biggest uh, components that had electronics in them. Over the next 10 years, that expanded rapidly to include things like engine controls, climate controls, body controllers, all kinds of other electronics. And we were fortunate enough to be able to participate in a lot of those repair opportunities as they grew. Yeah, um, and as the company kind of grew, um, our reach grew, we dabbled in a little high power rectifier repair and so we naturally transitioned and pushed our way into this ev space with my dad really being the driving force behind if this company is going to survive if we're going to be in remanufacturing in repair for another 40 years what do we need to do differently um, what do we need to do in our organization to make sure that we can still service oems um, and that was very clearly a shift to supporting EV, not only the car manufacturers, but probably first it's looking at the chargers because those are gonna break faster and uh, they're gonna be a, you know, a bigger need to build that infrastructure. Um, and so that's where we kind of found this niche um, and been crazily involved with it so fast. So is this a, a fundamental pivot for ATS? I mean, are you guys looking at this being a part of the company roadmap holistically moving forward, or is this kind of a bolt-on service? Is ATS still doing a lot of other kind of OEM and other uh, manufacturing repair on the, the vehicle front? Yeah, we still have uh, several customers that are uh, OEs uh, on the either automotive or heavy-duty truck side that we support a variety of products on. We still have, as Alex mentioned, uh, we're a North American Depot Repair Center for a large telecom company. We support all their high power rectifier repairs, not only in the U.S., but the entire North America. So it's, uh, it's a continuation of what we've done all along. And as, as we go along, I think you'll see that we're adding some additional support services that will help the industry. I think that's an important point. So you guys' experience doesn't just expand to different OEMs and on the vehicle front. I mean, you guys are doing technical repair way out of uh, vehicle-related technologies, obviously with EVSEs. But, you know, as this world kind of starts blending together and we think about how, you know, charging systems need to be connecting and communicating with the vehicles themselves, there's a lot of that kind of correlated experience with stuff that you've done. I think telecom is a good example. Is that fair? That's fair. That's a very, very good uh, example. Yeah, the... Uh, you know, the industry is growing so rapidly. There's many changes going on with chargers and, and the automotive side as well. And, you know, we're just trying to keep up with the changes that are happening because it's, uh, as you know, it's pretty, uh, pretty rapidly changing. Yeah, our core competency is what we would call component level repair. But so many things today need component level repair. As my dad indicated earlier, when they first started repairing things, there were very few electronics in cars. Today, there's electronics in everything. So our reach has just really been broadened by 
electronics just, you know, being in everything that we touch every day from phones, telephones, uh, car radios, stereos to chargers and, and beyond. So everything that we touch in our daily lives is becoming a market for us at ETS. If, if you think about the electrical content in terms of dollar value, reaching back into the 80s, it was, you know, maybe five or six hundred dollars worth of electronics. In the 90s, that jumped to, you know, two or three thousand dollars. And now they're pretty much all electronics. So, you know, if we're not there yet, that's where it's going. So, uh, you know, in this whole EV ecosystem, I mean, there are electronics and software in everything. Like to this point, I mean, these, these things are computers on wheels, they're batteries on wheels, you know, everything is electronic or software based from, the, from, from A to Z here, right? So, but it sounds like EVSE specifically has been kind of a primary focus area. It sounds like that's an area that you guys really want to try for it. What's the rationale for jumping into that versus maybe battery remanufacturing or some other element on the EV cycle? Or is that still also part of the plan? Well, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't throw it out. The battery recycling is, uh, you know, a very risky proposition right now. Uh, we targeted uh, charging uh, stations because we know there's going to be, you know, if not millions, hundreds of thousands of these nationwide, and they're going to need support for all kinds of reasons, as we're seeing already. So we see that as a huge repair opportunity for us going forward. And we're also, uh, as we'll talk about in a bit, we're pivoting to be able to provide field support as well because the OEMs really haven't been able to keep up with the need for field support. Yeah, I would say when you think about infrastructure and being a, a pillar of support for something in, in infrastructure, that becomes a really safe aspect of business to get behind, right? When we look at COVID and we look at the businesses that were kept open during COVID, right? It was anything in critical infrastructure support. So if we can get behind something like chargers that are the gas stations of the future, right? If we can support a fraction of that industry or a part of that infrastructure piece, we're going to be doing a lot to secure our business for the future. Um, other than the fact that charging is cool and charging is good for the environment and all of these things that make this a really feel good business for us, um, it's also a really good business decision to get into this industry, right, as we shift from ICE vehicles. Yeah, yeah, I, I want to build on that. So let's talk, I kind of want to talk about the scope, but not just the scope, but the scope of the problem here. So, you know, kind of to your point, I mean, there are 270 million light-duty vehicles registered in the United States, right? And, you know, the adoption rates are going through the roof of uh, EVs right now, just with fuel economy uh, concerns and also just the interest, climate change. I mean, there's a myriad of reasons why people are looking at adoption. And we're seeing kind of this hockey stick curve of interest, right, uh, especially on the light-duty side. And uh, the OEMs on the heavy-duty side are pushing out products faster than ever. I mean, we're seeing big changes in, de in uh, deployment schedules and investment from the OEMs themselves on what kind of uh, targets they have for production. I mean, crazy stuff is happening on the, on the light duty EV, EV, EV front. So um, that's very clear. I mean, and so the, the vehicles are coming. Um, as a result, the charging systems are coming to support that. Like, that's going to be needed, right? So that, that in and of itself is a, an enormous logistical challenge, I think, that we can solve. But that is a huge challenge. But what is the biggest problem that we see with this? Like when you guys are thinking about that opportunity, you see all of these chargers out there. Talk a little bit about like why maintenance is such a big focus for you. You want to take that one, Alex? I would love to. Yeah. Um, when we look at dependability, right, and uptime of charger stations, maintenance just becomes this really pivotal quandary, right? We can't sit here and depend on charging stations like we depend on gas stations today because there's so many different things that can go wrong or that need to go right before we are up and running with a solid infrastructure. So when we look at building out these charging stations on a national level and developing uptime that's 97%, 98% on a national level, we really need to be well planned out and, uh, you know, just really well supported by OEMs, by electrical contractors, um, by the utilities. Everyone needs to be working together on this, on this plan to ensure that this is a viable solution for the United States. There are so many different levels, like you were saying, Todd, of planning that needs to go into this to do this correctly that maybe haven't been thought out 100% yet that now when we're doing these big deployments and that we're doing these big projects, right now we have one going through Illinois that's I-55, I-80, we're planning to do all this build out. 
billions, trillions of dollars going into this. It opens up a huge opportunity for people like us to do the support today because people are wanting to adopt EVs and drive them today. They want to be green and do the right thing for the earth and every, everything that's pushing us in this direction. But we're almost putting the cart before the horse in a lot of ways because we haven't planned it out right yet. So it's important for all of us to take kind of like a couple steps back and say, okay, really, what is it that we need to make sure that we're doing to ensure that we can get the right power at site, that the right power charger is at site. So these vehicles aren't having to sit here for eight to 12 hours to get a charge so that they're the fast power and that people really don't have um, any hesitancy to really dive into this. Um, right now they have what they call range. What is it? What's the anxiety. term? Yes, anxiety. Yes, range yeah. anxiety. Where so many people are like, I want to have an EV, but I, I'm so scared that I'm going to get somewhere and then I'm going to be stuck with no charging. So we're, OEMs are pushing out all these cars, pushing out all these cars that are EV, 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 and we're still kind of behind in building up that EV charging. So I think when it comes to an operation and maintenance side, for people like ATS, for anyone out there that's looking to go here, they want to feel confident in the fact that, okay, if my charger breaks, I'm going to have somebody here today, tomorrow, within three days to fix this for me, so I'm still able to go places. Um, so on the O&M front for us, it's a really great opportunity because we've been able to offer solutions, pr create this electrical contractor network on a national basis, and start a field service solution that we haven't done field service, you know, since we were doing install in a long time. So there, it's just really complicated, but it's also really exciting. There's just, like you were saying, there's so many details of the plan to consider here um, to make sure that that adoption piece uh, can really be fully thought through. And Dan, yeah, do you have and, more and, on that? Yeah, yeah I do. I, I think it's, um, you know, there's the retail customer that's going to have range anxiety and not be uh, interested in getting in the electric vehicle until they're comfortable with the infrastructure. But flip that over to the commercial guy, the big fleet. You know, he can't be without the chargers being up and running because that's his revenue source, right? Those vehicles have to be on the road all the time. There needs to be a solution to make sure his chargers are running, right? Because that's revenue. Yeah, 100%. So I'm kind of hearing you guys break this up into kind of uh, two things. One, kind of a short-term problem right now. How do we address these kind of more significant issues that exist today to help with adoption? Because, um, you know, any sort of light-duty vehicle driver, even or I guess heavy-duty if you're in the fleet space, the worst thing that could possibly happen is, happen is have some range anxiety. I see you driving down the middle of the Central Valley in California, think that you're pulling up on your last mile to a charging system and have it not work or not be there or the cable is missing or some crazy thing, right? So there's a short-term problem here, and I kind of want to dive into that for a few minutes first. But uh, secondly, I do want to talk about kind of the importance on this planning and get some insights from you guys on what should be really considered on these kinds of deployments for, for large fleets, because things are going well beyond these kind of onesie, twosie, I want to test drive some level twos into some major deployments out there for you know many dozens, fifties, hundreds at a time, um, and things that people need to be thinking about on here. So kind of on the, backing up just a little bit on the, on the short term on the short term front, um, as it relates to the, kind of the, some of the services you guys offer what are, what are we seeing I've, I've heard you know we do know that there are now more and more requirements for uptime things like 95 percent plus if you want to get funds from certain programs out there that's all really important but that's still very forward thinking what are we seeing right now i mean vehicle adoption is happening now right so uh what is, I, i've we've heard horror stories of, of, of 30 percent or higher level two vehicle charges are, are not functional right now or are not being reported correctly or something what, what's your experience uh, currently, and, and what are you guys doing to kind of help alleviate that? Well, we talked to the Clean Cities folks who are a member of several of the chapters, and that's where we got the numbers about how many uh, were not working percentage-wise across the country. And, you know, we've heard numbers from 40 to 60 percent failed for one reason or another. Um, and how that breaks down is, you know, the charger itself could be bad, uh, or it could be physical damage. We had one from a Nissan dealer in Virginia just yesterday. Somebody rammed into two of his chargers. Uh, and then site powering problems. We've had stuff where the voltage isn't right, the phase isn't right, uh, it's intermittent, loose connections, and then communications issues. We were just on the phone with an OEM this morning, and she said that 90% plus of her failures in the field are related to communication. Um, 
David, you had mentioned uh, that there's kind of a myriad of problems going on. Connectivity is a big one. Obviously, that's really important. So if I, I've got a printer behind me. This thing is down more than 30% of the time or maybe about that. That's okay because it's a printer. That's not okay if that's my car charger uh, or my network of car chargers, right? So on the on the connectivity problem, what what's really kind of being done these days? Is that a solution that is easily solvable? I mean, is that an OEM problem? Is that a service that something like ATS can come in to connect and help with, or how does that work? So it's a it's a field problem. You're clearly a site problem. Whether they're you know they've lost their internet or whatever the case may be, a piece of equipment's failed. Uh, but we, you know, part of our discussion earlier with this OEM was, you know, she's sending all of her team out with a field signal strength meter so that when they go to the site, they can tell if the signal strength is good enough to be able to transmit and receive the signal. So the that's like signals. a, yeah, exactly. Key component. And uh, maybe uh, also kind of talk a little bit to some of the other failure modes here. So, you know, there's a, the EVSE itself, a lot of componentry, a lot of communication problems. Uh, talk to maybe the physical problems. I mean, what else is happening? You're saying obviously they get ran into or bugs or whatever. I mean, how common are these kind of failure modes? How important is that when people are looking at deploying these things to understand, you know, UL listing or, or reliability or uh, defensibility on this stuff? Sure. Internal issues like power modules. Uh, communication boards uh, that might be internal to the unit. Uh, we talked about the network issues, uh, powering issues, uh, wrong, incorrect site power, out of phase. You know, I mean, it's it's a myriad of things uh, right now, and and we're seeing uh, you know a good a good number of all of those. As I as I mentioned, the call we had with the OEM earlier today, she said that ninety plus percent of the failures that she's seeing with their equipment in the field is network related some sort of communication issue right so uh, and uh maybe explain to me alex you had mentioned the the network of technicians you guys are working with uh maybe the network of, of, of electricians you considering that kind of failure mechanism maybe all of the other ones as well can you guys speak a little bit to you know who's who's needed on site here is this the kind of maintenance that you know some in-house operations team can deal with or are like fully fledged electricians needed is it remanufacturing is it technicians who's who's uh, the most needed resource here when people are thinking about how to plan around yeah, what we're really seeing that's working the best right now is a certified electrician in the field only because there's so much powering and technical knowledge that needs to go into just understanding the setup of what these charger needs, especially when you get into something like a DC fast charger that's going to be 120 kilowatts, 150 kilowatts, 180 kilowatts. Some of the newer ones, they're even talking in the three and 400 kilowatts. That is some serious power. You don't want somebody that doesn't truly understand what that power can do going into a field, even just to run a, a basic test. So our network of a uh, uh, of field techs is really only certified electricians with prior experience um, in EV chargers. A lot of the electrical contractor schools out there or just like electronic schools that people are going to today have these EV certification programs that are being built into the training because it has been so apparent that this push to electrification, this push for EV is, is, the, is the future. Um, so for us, it's number one, an electrical contractor certified trained in EV and number two, somebody that has already had previous previous experience, not only with EV, but also like we would love OEM specific training. There's so some OEMs that we work with that provide on-site training and do what they call train the trainer. So they train one trainer at a, like at a, at a contractor, and then that trainer is responsible for uh, passing all that information down to the rest of the trainers in their company. So you just really get a robust training program that's full of knowledge. It's got all the specs for like, you know, company A's chargers. Here's how company A and company B charger might differ. So it's our hope to really develop this network of uh, contractors that, you know, they can be like, okay, well, a site over in New England, we have a juice bar charger and they need field service. And this is what we know about juice bar. But at a, a site over in California, they have an EV energy charger. And this is what we know about EV energy and the common failures. Um, so it's really to build out this program that is really intelligent and, you know, really based on foundations of knowledge for contractors. Um, the reason why you can't do any Joe Schmo off the street here is because you know, I walk up to a charger and it could be hot and I could get electrocuted 
that's dangerous. I don't know what I'm really looking at as a just a general consumer. There's air codes. They're making these chargers really smart now to be self-diagnostic and actually provide this data back to users. So in the long term, what we view for the, the whole industry and the repair industry is that these chargers will become way more module. You won't need an electrician. The charger will be able to tell you that, oh, the control module here is bad or this certain component. You'll be able to make sure it's powered off, open up the whole charger and say, okay, this is the, the module that I want to remove and I'll have this replacement module that I can just put in. I'll have this broken module that I can take and ship to somebody like us where then we in-house can do component level repair and it just makes everything more efficient less costly because you know an electrical contractor is going to cost you hundreds of dollars an hour where you know a regular you know field tech or something could be a fraction of that um so that's kind of how we're handling our field tech and the the technical requirement um of of need in the field right now that makes sense and then, so just to clarify you were kind of looking into your crystal ball there looking at a, a time horizon where this kind of in modular componentry slapping in and out is so that's not really an active technology available today from any particular way but they are considering it kind of looking at that sort of way to help sort of you know manage maintenance yeah that's what we've we we've, we've learned from our history in kind of advanced exchange um and my dad can tell, speak to the story about how you know you used to leave the car dealer without a radio um so when we've spoken to a lot of these OEMs about their design aspects, um, their level three DC fast chargers, they're huge. They're thousands of pounds. They can't feasibly you know, move these units to a place like us. They have to come up with something that makes a lot more sense as far as how to repair them, how to re repair pieces of them. And um, shipping costs are expensive. And um, that that's the solution. So, Dad, if you want to tell your your radio story, I always like hearing that one um, about back in the day. Took uh, the radio back in, out. Yeah, back now in the, now you have to tell us. Yeah, back in the day, uh, if you had a defective radio in your car, you brought it to the dealer. He took the radio out, sent you on your way, and he called you in three weeks when the radio was back. Uh, in the '90s, we worked with GM, Ford, and Chrysler and helped them develop an advanced exchange program nationwide, so that if a dealer had an issue with your car. We knew it was coming in with a bad radio. He would call someone like us. We would send the advanced exchange out. The radio or dash was there when you got there. They swapped it out. You're on your way. The defective component came back to us or another repair center where it was repaired, modified, upgraded, and put back on the shelf for the next customer. That's how we see this industry evolving. Ah, that's fantastic. So no more waiting necessarily or very limited waiting from these kinds of deployments to get something in, swap it out, send it back out for prayers, put that one back in the loop for you guys to do the next one out. So can you guys t talk a little bit about that? Um, curious about your relationship with these OEMs. So, uh, you know, uh, part of me feels like this maintenance issue right now, and we know level two charging is going to be around forever, right? I mean, it's a great charging solution for a myriad of duty cycles and operations, the businesses, people are at their work, they're at home, whatever. They don't need a full DC fast charger all the way. There's going to be a lot of level two charging going on for the foreseeable future. So, um, you know, it does feel like, you know, this uptime problem is kind of related to the OEMs. I mean, they are unable to provide this support themselves. But, you know, you guys are seemingly establishing really good working relationships with the OEMs also. So can you kind of like speak to that? I mean, I love that radio example, David, about being able to establish this kind of uh, supply support, this, uh, um, this, this replacement support. Um, kind of talk a little bit about that and uh, kind of tell us about kind of, yeah, how are you working with these OEMs? What does that mean for being able to replace parts or replace whole EVSE system? So for, uh, just a little backstory on the, on the supply chain. You know, it's definitely slow to get parts now for repairs. We've waited 90, 120 days for dispensers. If we've had to send a unit out to an OEM because they wouldn't sell us the part, that's been that, you know, three months or longer. The, the turnaround times are just not where they need to be. You know, we're a ways from a, a while away from being that advanced exchange model, I think. The first of all, as Alex indicated, the, the OEMs have to make their products modular and serviceable, more readily serviceable in the field. I don't think that's there yet, right? It's gonna take three to five years, maybe even longer before they get there. And and some are gonna get there ahead of others. But um, you know, we're still seeing extended lead time on many parts. Uh, and, you know, the lead times are, are even affecting new chargers. For example, level three chargers from companies, uh, and I'm not going to mention any company names, but uh, for several of the big players, the lead time on level three chargers is over a year. 
Now, I think that's twofold. I think it's supply chain issues and I think it's demand issues, right? Big companies are coming in and buying hundreds, if not thousands of units from these OEs and they're just not available. So there's a lot of supply chain issues, uh, both based on demand and based on supply. And it's going to be a while before we get to the advanced exchange model that I think it will eventually evolve to. And then your question about our relationship with the OEMs. We initially started this this journey trying to just target OEMs and say, we want to be your repair center, your U.S. Depot repair center. And that's kind of how everything for us snowballed from just wanting to do in-house component repair to really realizing that, okay, an OEM today is not going to want to invest in a depot repair center for their first version of their first charger that they've ever made. So what we've learned from all of this, okay, so we've learned that their first their first charger, they're eventually going to want to make modular, especially, obviously, we're not talking the small level ones, but we're talking the level twos and especially the level threes. So from our initial calls with, you know, OEMs that are U.S. based and non-U.S. based, we have learned so much about everything that has to do with EV charging. Um, that really, number one, no OEM is ready for a U.S. based repair depot yet because they're not really happy with their current, and it's not the best they're going to make. So it's not the one that they're going to sell for a long period of time. They want to make, they want to own the market share first. And I think what we're seeing is there's so many different companies that are trying to win that market share that once we iron out and once we even out and once we have like maybe the three big players, then we'll be in the, the running to become that US-based repair depot. Um, you saw the same thing with cars when they first became, you know, when it was Ford and everybody else, um, then, you, then you had the big three. So it's going to be a similar thing now because there's probably hundreds. You find, if you go to Amazon, you find hundreds of different chargers that you can buy and have them to your door in a couple of days. A lot of those companies are going to, you know, dissipate over time as the real big players in this market rise to the top. Mm-hmm. And um, so our relationships with our OEM partners um, have been really informative today. They haven't generated for us a lot of direct business with them, but what they have generated for us is a lot of business from dealerships because now the OEMs know that we're, you know, we've been doing this for 40 years. We are competent in component level repair. We can understand field services. Uh, we, we know how to do the powering. We are getting referrals direct from OEMs to people that they have already sold their chargers to that say, you know what, we, we're not doing like the field service or the support on it, but talk to these people because they will possibly be our future service provider or depot repair center. So that's kind of how our OEM relationships have played out in this space just over the past like couple of years. And it's been really fruitful for us, just not directly with the OEMs, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does make sense. You know, I, I think it's increasingly important that this kind of role that you guys are playing uh, continue to be fostered because, you know, I, I, nothing is going to stop this land grab that the OEMs have right now, right? Like you, like you said, that this is a market share opportunity. They have hundreds of thousands of these things to get out the door, and it does, you know, their 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 revenue is associated with the sale of these things uh, ultimately, right? And not necessarily the O and M. Uh, but you know, a big part of the discussion as as people like us in this space understand that that has a meaningful influence on this adoption rate, on the end user experience, on what's happening with the EVs themselves and, and ensuring that if we're really trying to push forward in this industry and get these EVs on the road and kind of, you know, get our fuel supply under control and get these, uh, get greenhouse gas reductions in place, man, uh, this is really, really important to undersure, ensure that the user experience is good. And so getting all of the chargers out there, but if only, you know, if 30% of them aren't working, I mean, that's a big problem for wide worldwide adoption here. So I, I, I think that's important, whether or not it's a direct, explicit relationship, you know, and maybe it's not in-house at in OEM, but, you know, those kinds of relationships that you guys can establish. And I love that you guys are forward thinking, too, on um, understanding that this uh, component uh, kind of modular approach is, is in the pipeline. It's really kind of a, a refreshing take to hear. That's, that's a new one I've seen uh, um, so far. So I, I do want to kind of pivot this a little bit to planning. So, you know, again, there are a lot, especially on the commercial side, so a lot of commercial fleets out there, especially on the light duty side, lots of light duty vehicles coming down the road. Ford and GM really hitting it hard on uh, fleet vehicles, white truck vehicles going out the door, a lot, of, a lot of class three to six vans going out the door, all sorts of big stuff on the commercial EVs, EV front. 
Um, there's some high uh, high level ideas, you know, that fleets are considering things that they know they need to do, or they know they need to go engage with the utility. They know maybe that transformers also have a long lead time, right, to to get these projects in hand. Uh, but there's not a lot of knowledge outside of that, right? So um, especially when it comes to O and M on this stuff, I mean, I think a lot of them maybe don't know that their own vehicle fleets are going to have uh, somewhat some downtime on the EBSE front. So when you're thinking about a fleet, you know, maybe a, a beer and beverage distributor, for example, who's looking at deploying a hundred of these things at one of their facilities. What do they need to be thinking about? How do they plan around level two or, or more powered um, charging systems? What's important? How does that relate to what they're procuring? How, do that, how does it relate to how they're budgeting for O&M? Well, you know, in our discussions, we're, we're kind of leaning towards suggesting that if they're buying a hundred chargers, that they should get like three to 5% more of the same charger and keep them nearby so that if a unit goes down, They've got quick access to a replacement unit that can be, you know, swapped out and be ready to go. And especially with these uptime requirements from the government for in terms of financing or grants, they are going to need to have those up and running. The other thing I, I strongly suggest is that uh, let's say they choose a particular OEM manufacturer. They need to be working with that manufacturer to make sure that the standard and, and uh, let's call them common failure parts are readily available in the U.S. and nearby. So that if the unit needs to be fixed, the parts are available to fix it, right? Are those all things equal amongst EVSE OEMs? Or, I mean, are, are parts readily available or at least kind of off-the-shelf parts available? Like, is that the same from EVSE manufacturer to manufacturer? All, all unique to the, to the manufacturer. Okay, so they, these fleets really need to be engaging with each of these manufacturers, get a clear understanding of what is or is not available for common failure modes. Absolutely. Connectors being yeah. a good example of that, or cables. Yep. Huge, and so uh, I think even before before this, right? If I'm if I'm a fleet, I'm looking at number one, my site. Is it powered correctly? Do I have the right electrician? And am I eligible for any type of grant funding based on my location um, and based on my state? There's a lot out there. Then do I fall in a, do I fall within a region? And and you're going to be the guy to talk about this, Todd, where there's tax credits available, right? There's LCFS credits. Is that something that I could benefit from as the owner of this charger? And who who can inform me about this some more? That's something that when we've been talking to people, it's people don't know anything about these credits and what that can mean for them. And they're excited. As an Illinois company, we're excited that this could be coming to us because that is so much money back in a consumer's pocket or an owner's pocket that, you know, for, for people in Illinois, we don't know anything about tax credits or, or trading credits or what that looks like. But that's something huge that you guys can bring to the table for even our customers. So what is something that looks like, what does that look like for our customers and how do we inform them of all these great things that are out there? So the planning for, before we even start looking at OEMs is like, okay, really what what's available for us out there and what does that mean as far as our budget goes? So. These are all budgetary concerns before we're even getting into the nuts and bolts of the OEM or the hardware aspects. Um, so that's, I think, where we've really found this partnership beneficial because when we're thinking about, oh, the dollars and cents of it, that's important. Although we know the budget for these things are huge because level two and three chargers are thousands of dollars. The level threes are in the, you know, 50 grand ish. Um, yeah. But the, the money adds up when, when we're, we're talking government credits, tax credits and things like that. And then getting to the points that my dad was saying about making sure you're vetting the, the OEM. Uh, did all their chargers go through testing and who are the right OEMs for you based on their operations and, and maintenance serviceability standards? Yeah, absolutely. It sounds like the real takeaway here is like the worst thing somebody could really be doing is waiting, right? I mean, it's going to take a long time to really figure out what kind of tax incentives are available, how you leverage things like the low carbon fuel stand, for example, to get that recurring revenue coming in. You know, how, what are my lead times with my different hardware choices, whether that's level two or level three charging? How is the utility reacting? What is my utility doing on this? How do I vet, you know, different electricians out there? How do I vet these technology platforms, these EVSE manufacturers? There's a lot to think 
going through in all of this. And it sounds like the, you know, that it's important to really start looking at this holistically. Now, maybe not even just for that particular fleet, but maybe taking a, a three or five year outlook on really what you want to do, especially if you're thinking you have to work with the utility and are pulling new copper or doing whatever you need to be doing. I mean, that's a pretty um, invasive upgrade often, right? So how do you plan around this in the long term um, for this kind of hardware and this kind of deployments? And, you know, what does it mean when modular approaches are available down the road? Right. It's a lot, to, yeah. a lot to think about. One of the uh, one of the things we learned here recently, and, and I'm sure you're probably aware of it, but the automotive OEMs are mandating to their automobile deal, dealer customers a certain level of charging requirement by a certain period of time. Uh, and you know, you guys have been exposed to it much sooner than we have. And what's happening is the automotive OEMs know it's coming throughout the rest of the country, and they're trying to get their dealer base ready for it. And I just think it's it's so interesting. Uh, that what they're requiring from these guys, and to Alex's point, it's not just about chargers. Is what's what's their electrical infrastructure like today, and what's it need to be tomorrow and five years from now? Because it's obviously going to get higher kilowatts, faster charging, which is going to require more power. So you can't just can't just power it for today. You need to power it for the future. I kind of want to take to take, uh, go down that road here real briefly as well. In you know, we're based out here in California. You know, thirty five percent of the EVs in the United States are based here in California. We've had you know, kind of been uh, on the tip of that tidal wave for a little while. But you guys, are, you're in Illinois, and you guys are jumping in with both feet here, and you're really seeing kind of this kind of activity push across the United States, or really kind of mushroom up all over the board. Can you, what do you what are you guys seeing in this space? Where are things happening? Is it all explicitly out here? Because it doesn't feel like that anymore. Alex, you want that one? Uh, I was going to have you tell your story about the dealer you talked to in Washington, if you want to sure, go sure. there. So we did a, we talked to a Nissan dealer in the state of Washington, and during they were looking for, initially it was a repair, and then it evolved into some a quote for new chargers. And during the conversation, I asked the owner and the general manager, I said, let me ask you a question. What percentage of the cars you sold last year were electric vehicles? And he said, well, it would have been higher, but it was at least 50%. Now, if you compare that to what's going on in, in the Chicago or the, the Midwest area, we're maybe at 5 or 6%, right? I talked to a guy in Virginia this morning. He's barely a percent, right? But it's coming, right? And the automotive OEMs realize it's coming, and they're, they're pushing on their dealers now to start the upgrade process uh, and plan for the future of the EV charging network that they're going to require in all their dealerships. And, I mean, for example, a Ford... Four dealers have been told that it's a half million to $1.2 million investment is required. And by the way, if you're not willing to make that investment, you can't sell electric vehicles after 2023. Yeah, and Ford's, I mean, they, they were, you know, a couple, a couple years ago now made these commitments that they're transi transitioning all of the engineering resources, manufacturing resources like crazy into EVs because they see it themselves. They're trying so to catch up, of, yep. They're, yeah, absolutely trying to catch up. And I, it feels like, you know, in these different different states, these different jurisdictions, especially outside of California, though, that these these rates of adoption are going to go really quickly from 1% to 3% to 5 to 10% to higher really fast. And you start thinking about what's happening with supply chain, with the availability ability of this stuff about working through utilities and again it's uh you know can be a long lead item and so to get out in front of this as fast as possible no matter where you are in the united states or north america frankly um is extremely important Absolutely. yeah i really started seeing a huge push um and this is when it became really apparent to me super bowl 2022 is when i felt like all the car companies they were hitting everything was EV. You saw Ford Lightning and everything. And even with Hurricane Ian, there were huge stories about how the Ford Lightning was powering communities in Florida and how cool that was and how, you know, it just organic marketing for the EV industry about how like, you know, the reverse grid opportunity here for cars that can then power back up the network after they've the network has charged them. Um, so just really interesting things coming, I think, for the electrical economy, if we can call it that, um, not only within EV, but we're seeing things like solar and everything just really skyrocket when it comes to energy. Um, and just, you know, it's, it's really interesting to be a part of. Um, the dealers here have jumped on the, the emails that we've been sending out about like, hey, we can provide you with a solution for the, you know, the, the Model E certification that Ford is demanding of you. And we've been getting calls on those um, marketing attempts pretty regularly. So it's been a very hot thing lately and it's exciting to be a part of. 
Absolutely. I mean, the, the, this electrification wave is coming, um, and you guys are all in a very good spot for it, kind of like us. So, I mean, you know, we don't inherently represent any particular OEM, or, you know, we don't, we work with everybody, with every kind of fleet, with every kind of technology, um, and you guys work with a, a lot of them yourselves, right? And so you kind of become this, this trusted third party resource to really understand what, you know, what is uh, actually happening in this space, and that's going to be increasingly more and more important. Uh, just to wrap up here, uh, Alex and Dave, again, I'm, I'm extremely excited and thankful for you guys to uh, join the charge cycle today. Um, if someone's looking to reach out to you guys, get a little more information about you or your company or your, uh, your expertise, uh, what's a good way someone can uh, contact you? The website, uh, www.ats4solutions.com, and of course, our, uh, our toll-free number, 800-323-4813. Perfect, and we will put uh, both of those in the notes for uh, the show notes for the for the podcast. You guys can find those there. Uh, David, Alex, thank you again very much for uh, joining the chart cycle. We're talking through uh, these O and M related issues. We're uh, excited where you guys are headed. We're excited about where this industry is headed, and uh, thank you very much for jumping on with us. Thank you, Todd. Thank you so much, Todd. This was so much fun. You are a natural podcast host. I got to say, You're crushing it. More and more. We'll, we'll uh, hopefully uh, soon we'll have you guys back on. We'll talk about all those wild uh, successes for everyone. Perfect. Sounds thank good. you. Right. Thanks well, so much. Thank you to the listener. And thanks again for tuning into the Charge Cycle, where we talk all things fleet electrification. Get out there and get plugged in.